It's really hard to actually compare stocks directly right across the market. So it's hard to say um, Commonwealth Bank is going to be a better investment than BHP because they're so wildly different. Um, and you've got to make some big calls in terms of what's happening in the world. Um, the biggest driver there is probably going to be what's happening to interest rates around the world and, and global growth. Uh, that can be a really difficult thing to, uh, to forecast. There's much more uh, likelihood you'll make errors. So we split the market up into eight broad groups. Uh, they range from domestic and global cyclicals to defensives, growth stocks, um, gold resources, REITs and, and yield stocks. And we really focus on uh, looking at stocks within those groups. So it's a lot easier to say uh, Commonwealth Bank looks like a buy versus Westpac or um, computer share looks like a buy versus ANZ. So not necessarily a bank, but still a financial impacted by yields. You don't have to worry so much about what's happening in the world, just worry about the fundamentals of, of those companies and, and what's driving their earnings. So splitting the market up into to groups that make it easier to compare stocks, it actually makes our job easier in terms of investors picking uh, good and bad stocks, uh, being able to go long and short, but it helps us control our, our macro risk as well, where we're not um, necessarily taking a, a big bet that we're unaware of, like uh, we're long value versus growth and that can just shift as real yields shift around the world. So um, by being balanced between those sectors, uh, we strip out a lot of the macro risk and allow our ability to forecast company earnings and, um, and individual stocks to come through. Yeah, the percentage of calls you need to get right to outperform is actually surprisingly low. So uh, a lot of people think, oh wow, to be a great investor, you've got to get 90% of your calls right. Um, if you're running a, a broad diversified fund like we do with a range of long and short positions, the threshold to actually consistently add value is, is far lower. If you're hitting 55% right and 45% wrong, you're actually doing really well um, as a, uh, in terms of your portfolio and the returns you can deliver. If you can hit 60% of your calls correct, you're top of the pops, you're really knocking it out of the park um, on a consistent basis. So domestic cyclicals is, is made up of obviously companies that are exposed to the domestic economic cycle. So that'll include things like building materials with a housing cycle, uh, retailers, media companies, um, but other miscellaneous industrials as well. So you know, a company that we're long there at the moment that we've been buying uh, is uh, CSR, so exposed to the housing cycle. It's a very strong market going through there with a uh, you know, record level of uh, commencements for detached family homes, so they'll continue to benefit from that pipeline of work for, for several years. Uh, on, the, on the short side, something that we're looking to actually uh, hedge that position with is Qantas, which uh, is recovering now that we've got through COVID and the, the shutdowns, uh, but it's got some challenges. Business travel is going to be um, a little bit more uh, challenging as people tend to replace travel with, with Zoom meetings. And that's a high yield uh, part of their overall market. Uh, you've got a reasonably um, rational duopoly there with Virgin, but Rex snipping around the edges. But importantly, the share price has just recovered so far and they've raised a lot of debt. So the enterprise value now is you know, really at pre-COVID levels. So risk returns just uh, not there for us on that one. So global cyclicals is probably the most diverse um, set of stocks that uh, we have. It includes everything from uh, mining services to agriculture stocks. Uh, as well as some, some um, global industrials, so things like you know, Brambles and Amcor and, um, and Ansel to um, yeah, you know, Incident Pivot and Orica. So um, they're actually a couple of stocks that we've got uh, long and short position in, at the moment. So Incident Pivot, um, we see real value in. It um, makes uh, you know, explosives and, and fertilisers. Uh, at the moment, um, the the value of um, fertiliser around the world's you know, really um, taken off, as with a lot of commodity prices. So things like DAP, diammonium phosphate, ammonium nitrate, urea, uh, all things that they produce are at, uh, at highs, and it's just not being reflected in the Instec share price. They've um, had some operational issues um, at, uh, at Wagaman in uh, Louisiana, got hit by a hurricane uh, recently. But um, they've sort of got over those, and we, you know, we see a lot of upside to commodity prices there. Orica is similar business, but not really the fertiliser side, so they're more ammonia nitrate for explosives, a bit more exposure into the coal sector, which has um, got pressure, a little bit more competition from imports. So a good hedge against uh, Instec there, but um, not the same uh, upside through fertiliser pricing um, and um, 
a little bit more downside from coal exposure. So defensive stocks include uh, everything from supermarkets, Woolworths and Coles, to telecommunications like Telstra, as well as a lot of infrastructure, things that are pretty safe. Their earnings don't change that much, like you know, Transurban or Sydney airports or, or things like that. So at the moment, um, one of our, our favourite stocks there is actually Auckland uh, International Airport. So uh, Sydney airports has been taken over, so we're rolling some of our long there into, into Auckland airports. Uh, you've got the recovery in, in travel to flow through there, but uh, they've actually got a lot of surplus land, a lot of industrial land uh, that's undervalued uh, within the company as well. So we are seeing the price of industrial real estate going um, around the world. We see the opportunities uh, either for them to monetise it or someone to take them out like uh, Sydney airports as well. Uh, on the short side, uh, uh, it's really just a valuation short with uh, Woolworths, which we think is a great company, uh, great track order track record of delivering uh, long-term earnings growth, uh, but uh, that earnings growth is more than fully captured in the share price, which um, uh, the multiples have really got up to, to record highs, so uh, that's a good uh, hedge in the space for us. Resources, a huge range of different commodity exposures through there. Uh, we see um, long potential, you know, as with everyone else, in electric vehicles and, um, and, and battery technology and the commodities that go in there. So that ranges from lithium to, to, uh, to copper and, and nickel, uh, things that go into batteries. So a stock we like there is uh, Independence Group, IGO, which um, has recently transformed its business. It sold its Tropicana gold mine uh, interest and bought um, Green Bushes, which is uh, you know, a very large uh, lithium play with uh, a lithium hydroxide refiner at Quinana as well. Uh, also has nickel and, and copper, copper exposure. So good spread of uh, metals going into uh, electric vehicles and, and batteries. And that thematic, I think, has uh, obviously got many years to, to run as uh, the world transitions uh, to electric vehicles. So on the short side and resources, uh, we've seen a real shift uh, coming out of China in the last year or so. So they've really tightened up credit availability particularly for the, uh, the, the property sector. Uh, and that's led to uh, a lot of distress there and, and companies like Evergrande are uh, looking like they're hitting the wall and now sort of cascading defaults going through the, the property sector there. Combine that with some tightening steel production to hit uh, emission targets and, and uh, carbon dioxide emission targets. And Chinese steel production has just dropped off a cliff in the last half of the year and it's taken the iron ore price with it. So uh, the other thing that happened is discount for low grades has also expanded. So yeah, on the short side, we're looking at companies like Fortescue, which uh, was a bit tricky at the start of the year because it looked really cheap with massive free cash flow yield. But because it's um, a pure iron ore play and particularly that 58% grade discounts widening, its uh, cash flow is rapidly uh, plummeting. So uh, we still see short potential there. Gold is uh, an interesting group. We split out from resources mainly because it behaves differently from the other resources. Uh, it behaves a little bit more like a currency, the gold price. Um, it's driven by uh, real interest rates around the world and, and US real interest rates in terms of US dollars. And it's also very volatile um, and, uh, and can be defensive in, in certain market environments with uncertainty and volatility uh, and, and can you know, really um, break away from the broader resources. So we treat it separately. Um, a stock we really like there is Perseus. Um, and generally when we look at gold stocks, it's really the ability for uh, development, um, production expansion and, and upside, um, and where they sit on the, the cost curve. So um, Perseus has been doing a great job in terms of actually uh, delivering on, on production targets, but actually with some exploration development success and expanding its production profile going forward, so you know, creating value for shareholders. Uh, on the flip side, on the short side, uh, we've been shorting uh, Evolution, which got pretty expensive uh, and started to have a few production issues and, uh, and been coming under a little bit more pressure. REITs are generally pretty self-explanatory. They're obviously um, passive holding companies. There are a couple of other stocks there that are a little bit different that run sort of funds management models, so as well as the pure REIT holding, things like Goodman Group, Charter Hall, uh, Centuria, where they've got a funds management business uh, in there as well. And they're actually the sort of businesses that we like a little bit more in REITs because they do offer a little bit more growth. Um, so uh, they've often got uh, a child funds sitting under that they can invest in, but um, yeah, Charter Hall is one of our favourite companies there, quite exposed to the industrial space, industrial offices doing really well and they're continuing to, to grow their, their fund management business there as well. 
Uh, we're probably a little bit more cautious on the office market, uh, as we touched on before with, with business travel. People aren't coming back into the CBDs. They enjoy the flexibility of working from home. Uh, you're still seeing uh, very high office vacancies. Releasing spreads are down over 30%. So there's pressure um, in that office rental market. So we see that as a, a decent funding source. So you know, a, company of, a couple of REITs with higher office exposure there, things like DEXs and, and GPT. Yeah, growth's probably the most interesting and one of the more diverse but most important um, groupings that we look at. And it actually draws companies from a whole range of different gig sectors. It's got the obvious things in there like technology and um, some telco and, um, and healthcare companies, but also uh, it's got uh, you know, things like consumer discretionary like you know, Aristocrat or, or builders like James Hardy and, and Reliance Worldwide sit in there as well. Um, Breville Group on, uh, on the uh, retailing side as, as well as your obviously things like um, you know, Zero and um, you know, big growth companies. It's really important because um, it's really hard um, to manage your portfolio and decide whether you want to be in or out of those stocks because they often trade on huge valuation premiums to the rest of the market. So we just look at them separately. Um, so you know, a stock that we like there is something like James Hardy, which um, has been doing really well. Um, and its growth story is not just about uh, US and, and Australian housing growing, but their penetration of those markets. So penetrating those markets with their fibre cement siding products um, and growing their top line above market growth rates, um, getting into more value added products, expanding their margin, leveraging their, their operational efficiencies. And they're continuing to do that, tapping into new markets, addressing like uh, the stucco market in the US, moving more into higher value add products, moving more to direct consumer marketing as well. So we see on, ongoing strength there and you know, strong underlying US housing market as well. Um, uh, on, the, on the short side, we're looking more for stocks that are, tend to be um, pure bond proxies. So maybe in a rising rate environment, they don't have necessarily the strongest um, underlying um, earnings growth rate, but their valuations really expanded with low interest rates. So something there might be something like Next DC, which uh, has been growing really well. You know, data centres, everyone wants you know, hyperscale data centres, and they've got some good advantages in terms of co-location and, and, and cross-connects. But at the end of the day, it's a business about um, putting racks into air-conditioned buildings and the price of electricity. Um, so they're continuing to grow and develop it, but um, they're much more exposed just to pure bond yield changes and, and valuation changes. So in an environment where bond yields may be uh, lifting, we want growth companies that are actually able to grow their earnings and have a bit of leverage uh, to, to upside there. Yeah, yield uh, is a, a group of stocks that are generally more sensitive, obviously, to the yield curve, both its slope and its, its level. So there'll generally be financials, the banks fit in there, uh, insurance companies, as well as a, a range of um, diversified financials. So you know, with this backdrop that we've been talking about of potentially higher inflation and eventually uh, central banks tightening rates, uh, a company we quite like is Computer Share. So, it's got uh, huge cash balances, so it's a registry business that does a lot of corporate actions, mortgage servicing and, and the like as well. And part of that business means that uh, it leaves a lot of client money uh, on its balance sheet and escrow accounts and it often earns interest uh, itself on, on that cash. Uh, so when interest rates fell to zero, that had a real impact on its earnings, but it's one of the few companies that's really positively leveraged to interest rates going up. I recently bought a business from uh, Wells Fargo in the uh, US, which has actually pretty much doubled the size of those cash balances. So it's got real leverage to uh, short-term rates going up. Uh, on the flip side, uh, a company with short um, that a lot of people in the market are because it's so expensive, it's just uh, Commonwealth Bank, which uh, it's the premium quality bank out there, the best return on uh, interest, does a great job, best operations, but it's um, trading on over 20 times PE, uh, you know, very high price to book, you know, a huge premium to the other banks. It's the best, but it's just not that good. So the valuations become too stretched. So uh, we see that as a good hedge in terms of risk reward.